And so that is our primary obsession. How do we begin to teach people that they were not born a color, but that they were actually born human? And that therefore, as easily as people put on them particular identities, that our task politically and pedagogically as a university is to undo that so that they begin to encounter each other again, not as a race, but as human beings first. And that's very difficult, I can assure you. I've been here for five years and four months and three weeks and two days and 11 hours, and I can assure you, <laughs> I bear in my body some very heavy marks, you know, of the people who believe we're changing too fast and then the people who believe you're not changing at all. <laughs> it's a very interesting South African thing. But I do this because of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is, if our universities cannot be the first place that interrupts the bitter knowledge of white and black youth, after 18 years, even though they were born after Mandela, after it was a release from prison, after 18 years, they carry a very deep, deep set of knowledges about themselves and others. That's very hard to understand. So South Africans call them born free. They're not born free. They might have been born after into democracy, but they're not born free. They're born with the memories of others. They're born with the pain inherited from their parents. And everybody is a victim. Uh, Eva Hoffman, in a beautiful book, uh, After Such Knowledge, which is a book about her life um, as a second generation Holocaust uh, uh, survivor, she talks about the clash of martyrological memories. In other words, the clash of people, each of whom have a story of victimhood, and yet they've got to live together and sort things out. So let me just give you a sense of place. Say again. Yeah, okay, you're going to have to wait for the lecture. But I <laughs> So if you came in off the N1, which is the major highway running between Cape Town and Johannesburg, you would have immediately come to a building, but you won't see it unless, you've got it, unless you're an anthropologist unless you look for strange things as a habit. You would have seen a building there with a horrible title on it called Dam van Trane Bron van Herinneringe. Now, that's not the way you enter any modern city, right? Which is a dam of tears and a source of bitter memories. And you sort of say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, I just came here to have fun. You know, where's the zoo? No. You come in and people remind you of bitterness, of heaviness. And that is white Afrikaans people. That is not black people. If you went to the other side of the town and you gone, went to what was used to be called the, and please, if you have a moment, please go there. I've been there 17 times and every time I go in there, I am astounded by the heaviness of our history. And it used to be called the Boer War Museum. But the curator of the museum is a very wise man, and so what he's tried to do is to make it more inclusive. Because you can't have a war with yourself. You have to have a war with the British, first of all, and you have to have a war with black people. And they were all fighting together on both sides of the conflict. And so he's made it a little bit more inclusive. Uh, a great guy called Toki Pretorius. And when you go in there, you realize there is an, a wound that is not yet healed in South Africa, and that is the woundedness of the Afrikaans-speaking white people, what we used to call the Boers. And their primary grievance is with the imperial British. So I wrote to the queen, I really did. And I said, dear Liz, no, obviously I was more formal than that. <laughs> I was much more formal than that. And I said, you know, your majesty and all that nonsense. Um, I noticed that you went to Ireland to say sorry. Now, you know the way the English say sorry, particularly royalty, you don't really say sorry, you know, you, but you say sorry. So you've got to look for the words. So she went there, courageous soul, and she said to the Irish, if you know anything about the conflict there, she went to the Irish and said sorry. And then the president of Ireland 
went to England to reciprocate, to sort of, you know, and he made a speech earlier this year that I still believe will be recorded one day as the greatest speech of this decade. I've memorized the speech. Now, partly he's an academic and a poet. He's not just a president and a politician. But this is what President Michael Higgins said after the queen welcomed him to the castle, and he then responds. And he refers to the history of conflict between Ireland and England. And then he says this, and I want you to know this is the work I do here, or try to do here. He says, Your Majesty, I'm grateful that you have recorded the history of conflict between our two countries. But your words and your generosity this evening remind us to recall this. Every time I say this, I get goosebumps. The better versions of ourselves. The better versions of ourselves. Now, let me use a South African phrase here. Let's unpack that. <laughs> you see, when you say the better versions of ourselves, you imply there's a version you don't like. <laughs> right? The better version means there's a worse version. And part of the reason a lot of our conflicts, whether it is the Middle East, or whether it is Rwanda, or whether it is Syria, or whether it is Cyprus and Greece, part of the reason we find it so difficult to come together is that we insist on the worst versions of each other. And so how do you recall and bring to life the better versions of ourselves? That's the first thing I wanted to tell to you. Secondly, if you looked out of this window over here, sort of in that direction, about 120 meters from here, I've pasted. It's a horrible place where all our troubles amplified themselves in 2008. And that's the place called the Rates Male Residence where four white boys, students, racially humiliated five black workers. And this university became notorious. Uh, across the world, by the way. The Associated Press used to run stories on this almost daily out of the North America, um, the BBC. Everybody had a program on this place in the middle of nowhere in the Free State. And I was working at that point as a university administrator in Durban, and somebody from here called me and said, wouldn't you like to take this job? I said, yes, I would. I love trouble. So <laughs> I applied and got the job. And when I got here, I first of all came uh, undercover. In other words, nobody except the council of the university or the board. Nobody knew me. So I came in and pretended to be lost, which turned out not to be pretense. <laughs> <clears throat> and I saw two huge white guys sitting on a slab of concrete on that side of the campus. And they looked mean. They looked angry. In fact, the whole bloody place looked angry because of this stuff. The white people supported white people generally. Black people supported the black people. The white people said, what did they do wrong? The black people said, bloody racist. It was just totally divided. So I saw these two huge white guys and I forced myself, these were the two white guys, not you of course, and I sat between them. Now, I just want to say to you, don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> so I forced myself, sat there and I saw they were having lunch and I asked them in their language, which is Afrikaans, I said, could I please have a sandwich? <laughs> do not, <laughs> do whatever you do. <laughs> and I could see the one, because they don't know me, all they see is an overweight black guy, right? And I saw the one of them go red in the face. Now, if you lived in South Africa long enough, if a white guy goes red in the face, you start to run, you know? So I know, knew I had to introduce myself very quickly. So I said, don't worry, I, I'm your new rector. Oh, they said, no, 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 no. Please have a sandwich, you know, uh, you know, and so on. <clears throat> and so we talked and everything lightened up in a manner of speaking. 
And, <laughs> and then I said to them, now this is the title of my new book, by the way, or at least the subject of my new book, which I'll be writing at the end, finishing at the end of the year. I said to them, I'm your new vice chancellor, or the word around here in the Afrikaans universities is rector. I'm your new rector. What must I do for you? In other words, how can I serve you? Now, I've worked with students in different countries all my life, university students, so I know what they ask. They normally ask what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a teacher. I just jump on people who look like they're dozing off. Oh what does a typical student ask you when you ask them, what can I as your leader do for you? Make the food so better. Number one up there always is give us better food. Yeah, always. I mean, students, students, young people, young people. What? Better accommodation. Better accommodation, more accommodation, you know. Fees. Fees, bring them down or take them away. Make me pass without working. Make me pass without, are you South African? <laughs> <laughs> Only in South Africa will you hear that kind of nonsense. But yeah, no, you're right, you're right. <clears throat> And parking, parking, there's not enough student parking, you know, the normal stuff. Do you know what these guys asked me? They spoke with one voice as if it was choreographed, but it wasn't. They didn't expect me. With one voice they said, do not force us to integrate. Their mortal fear was to share a residence with black people. Of all the things they could ask me, their terror was being in the same space with black people. And I remember choking on my sandwich and saying, how is this even possible? So many years after apartheid, this is 2009, July. I thanked them for their sandwiches and I said, that is going to be the first thing that changes. The question is, how do you change that? How do you bring students into an understanding of themselves and others that overcomes 350 years of separation? Right? In fact, it is unreasonable to tell these kids to integrate when the entire world around them, their churches included, are segregated. You are kids from the rural areas of the Free State province who only know black people in subservient positions. And suddenly you're telling them to share a shower and a residence hall and a classroom and a place of worship with people who they think are inferior to them. That's unreasonable. You can't blame these kids if they have a fit. So how do you bring them into communion? How do you bring them into fellowship? How do you bring them into that understanding of themselves as human beings? And the short answer to that is with great difficulty. My research assistant sitting at the back there, she's going through all the, I've asked her to do a content analysis of all the newspaper articles in the Volksblatt, which is the local newspaper, on the university. And every now and again, like last night, she says to me, I can't believe the amount of space taken every day in the newspaper to say what an evil guy you are. <laughs> Where are your horns, she said last night. <laughs> and your tail, I suppose. And why does that reaction come? What did we do? We simply insisted that this be a place for all South Africans, including students from other countries. We simply said, be together. Didn't do anything beyond that. And that got the alumni, the parents, up in arms, big time, big time. The good news is the kids get it. They're in a different place. All 30,000 of them, well, there's one or two mad ones, but <laughs> Most of the students here are in a completely different space as a result of the very hard work of a team of about 28 people who work night and day to deal with this problem that I call 
nearness. So how did the team do this? This is what I want to share with you, and I'm going to go through a bunch of slides. See you later, Okay, here we go. So the first thing you had to realize is that physical proximity in and of itself is dangerous. That is, you can't put people together and walk away because then you have rates. You can't expect people with the rival knowledges of the past, the present, and the future to simply be together in the same residence hall, if not even in the same room. So what we decided to do was to, and I'm just talking about my part in this, not the 27 other people who worked much harder to do this, is how to get involved in the lives of students beyond simply being physically intimate, by which I mean being physically close. How do you get to something else beyond proximity? And one of the ways in which we do that is to go to everything the students do. So my wife and I brought a big house. Why? Not because we need a big house. So that on every other weekend, we could fill the place with students and teach them how to be together, how to be human. I go to their churches every night when I'm free, I go to, into one of their residences and I talk with them and I read books to them and I expect them to talk to me, etc., etc. Rudy Bass, my dean of students, does exactly the same thing and so do many other people. In other words, you immerse yourself in the lives of students. A student of ours died last week. My colleagues went to the funeral in Lady Grey. Why? Not because they have time to waste, but they're part of your credibility, part of convicting people around a different vision of the university is to be where they are. And so nearness doesn't simply mean being physically present. It means being present in the lives of people emotionally, spiritually, empathetically in ways that... So this university has, for most of its senior leaders, an open-door policy for first-year students. They can come in and go out anytime they wish to talk about anything. One of the great joys in my life is a student who comes in on the way to class and says, in Afrikaans, Professor, I have to run to class, but would you mind if I just take a minute uh, to pray for you, that you have a good day? I can't tell you what happens after the student leaves. I close the door, and I just have a good old cry. Isn't that to be blessed? Now, whether I agree with the prayer or not is not important, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what is important is that the student takes the time to share a prayer with somebody she hardly knows. That is the dependent variable. That's a reaction to something else, <laughs> okay? And that's why I'm so proud of what my colleagues have been able to do. Then you can't simply bring people into a place that you want to change after 111 years without changing the curriculum. So we are the only university that has a comprehensive core curriculum in which every first year student has to engage seven big questions in life. One question from astronomy, one question from nanotechnology, one question from history, which I teach here, one question from law, and so on. Questions like, what does it mean to be fair? in law. These are not all original questions. Uh, some of these I was inspired by what happens at places like Columbia University in New York, which one of the few that has a core in that country still. What does it mean to be just? How small is small? Are we uh, alone? That's the astronomy question. So the students go and measure the universe. In other words, to make sure they are educated before they are trained to give them a core knowledge base before they specialize. And so I teach the history one. You can imagine how much they hate this, even though I think I make the teaching very interesting, but they hate it because it confronts them with stuff they don't hear about. And I couldn't care less whether they agree or not. What I care about is whether they can reason through difficult issues, like who should get place in the medical school the white student or the black student, if there's only one place left. But the black student doesn't have a lot of distinctions, but she went to a very poor school. Do I recognize her history, or do I recognize simply merit on a page for the white kid? But what's the message to the white kid? 
if we don't bring hay. And so we talk around these issues in a way that makes simple things a little bit more complicated for them. Okay? They hate the cause when it starts. By the end of the cause, most of them, not all of them, say, okay, we get it. And then there's got to be nearness in real time. So on a regular basis, when I'm in town, I go and sit under one of these trees here and I say to the students, come and talk to me. And surprise, surprise, I used to think they would come and talk about fees and they would come and talk about... The thing they talk about most often are relationships. My relationship with my parents. My girlfriend left me for another guy. Um, my relationship with my lecturers. And simply doing that meant that a few years, after one and a half years of constant fighting, chaos, bullets on this campus, we have had now for the past three years total, total peace. We haven't had one public conflict event, not once. We haven't had marches and all of that stuff, unless it was peaceful protest on various issues. We haven't had bricks thrown at people all over the place. And the reason for that is quite simple. You deal with nearness before there's a problem. For those of you who have children, I see some young people here, may I speak as the father of two grown-ups. The best way to teach your kids to be peaceful is to love them before there's trouble. Love is a powerful form of discipline. And that's how it happens. Now, by the way, don't try to talk to me on Facebook because I've reached the limit. I have 5,000 friends. They're not really friends. Most of them are from uh, the union buildings, government, um, <laughs> spying on me. And on Twitter, I have about 63,000 followers. You can tweet. Now, last night, I'm sitting on a just about to board a plane, and there's a guy sitting next to me and says, you're tweeting all the time, what are you doing? I said, you know what, there's a student, this is in Johannesburg, there's a student at one of my residences who says she can't get hot water out of the geyser. So she tweeted that, and I immediately sent the tweet to Residence Affairs, and 10 minutes later, the geyser was working again. She thinks I'm sitting here. <laughs> Do you see the notion of nearness not as physical closeness, necessarily, but as emotional closeness. So in her mind, wow, my rector is close, but he's not, in a physical sense at least. And that helps sort out a whole lot of problems. South Africans, as you might have noticed, love to eat. And in this part of the world, they eat badly. They eat red meats for breakfast, you know. It's very bad. And so one of the ways in which we talk about difficult issues is to have regular calls to students to come and have a meal. So this is one of those breakfasts. Most times we put out the call on Facebook and they come uh, and they have to sign up, the first 12 or whatever sign up. This one, I want to specific people. So every one of the people here around this breakfast uh, table has a story. The woman in the wheelchair in the middle there, Lesejo, she's the head of our, captain of our rugby team. Any questions? <laughs> of the wheelchair rugby team. She's a fantastic young woman. Uh, one of those girls around the table was horribly assaulted off campus somewhere. Um, one of those students the girl next to the board there uh, sterilizes cats on campus. So she catches stray cats and sterilizes them and puts them back onto campus to keep down the rat population. I mean, the real rats. <laughs> and she came to me and said, I've run out of money. How can you help us? And I love that activism that says, I see a problem. How can I deal with it? And I'll come to you if I need help. That's leadership. Every one of them around that table has a beautiful story of recovery 
and of leadership. And simply by breaking bread in this culture, you are able to deal with so many issues around nearness. Now, you will notice in all of these pictures, you will never ever see an event that I attend where there's only black people. Nor will you ever see an event where I only have white people. I plan to make sure the groups are diverse so that they can learn from each other. It's very rarely that by some circumstance the groups would be completely different, uh, the same. Nearness is about truth telling. And so even though most South Africans, like most Americans, like I suspect most Australians, you don't want to talk about race, right? It's very uncomfortable. So you talk about other things, like sport, rugby, stuff like that. But nearness is impossible without talking about the difficult things. Not in a way that scares people, but in a way that invites people in for a difficult conversation. And so we talk openly, and our institute here, I hope you get a chance, is right next door here, to go to the Institute for Reconciliation and Social Justice. They set up talk shops on everything from gay and lesbian identity to xenophobia to, um, you know, sexism and so on. We talk about these difficult issues in order to get past it, in order to get past it. And so nearness invokes truth-telling. And then, here's a beautiful phrase from my favorite Christian author, a man called C.S. Lewis. And the people who know a little bit more about literature than I do say that this was not actually his phrase, it came from a fellow called Wordsworth. Nearness by resemblance. And what I liked about this story is this young woman is a poor white South African. And I often refer to her to teach my black activist students that apartheid was not just a racial system, it was also a capitalist system. It also kept people poor, <laughs> white people poor. And she is on our No Student Hungry program in which we feed students. We give them a food bursary in this turn for civic duty service. And I have literally seen, I saw this on Monday night with 12 young women whom we've had on the program for three years. I've literally seen people going from this thin, a young Zimbabwean girl called Malaysia, this thin, to being beautifully fed, full, confident, doing well in her very difficult program in the actuarial sciences. And I'm hoping I can hire as a lecturer if I can get past our immigration laws that doesn't like Zimbabweans here, so I'm fighting with these stupid immigration laws you know, at the moment. So Milani is on this program. Her parents died. She had a baby as a teenager from some fella. But she managed to get back into university and we put on this program. And one day, she noticed in her class a black guy was clearly hungry, and so instead of taking her bread home to share with her baby, which would be reasonable, she shares that bread that she has with the black student. At that moment, she doesn't see the epidermis. At that moment, she sees a common need, which is hunger. That is what I think C.S. Lewis means by nearness, by resemblance, when I begin to see you, not as Hutu and Tutsi, not as black and white, not as white Australian and Aboriginal, I see you for a common humanity that we share. That is my definition for the word transformation. And that is where most of our students, not all of them, because every year we get five and a half thousand new ones and you've got to start all over again. But at least you have three or four or five years of seniors who now have mostly bought into this vision of nearness. 
And then this happened. Our national religion is called rugby. Or soccer, depending on your taste. And we played the old enemy, which is Potchefstroom, now called Northwest University. And in the last seconds of the game, our lock forward, the guy on his knees, got the ball out of the loose scrum, ran towards the try line, and as the buzzer went off signaling the end of the game, he scored the try, the winning try. This was literally a year after I got here, so rates were still fresh in the minds of people. This black girl from the Eastern Cape got so excited about the try in overtime, she ran onto the field before the game was over because, you know, in rugby there's still something called the conversion. <laughs> okay, you must still kick the ball. Right? And she runs towards the guy in front of a couple of thousand spectators, grabs his face, and kisses him on his juicy lips. And suddenly, sir, you're awake. <laughs> okay. And I remember when the coach showed me this picture the next morning, I said, what on earth is this? And so you see the, I called her in. I said, my girl, what were you thinking? And she said, professor, it seems to me you've got a problem. <laughs> I don't. I tell you, one of the few advantages of being black is you can't blush. <laughs> <clears throat> and so you see, within the youth of South Africa, there is, and in the youth of your country, I can tell you that, there is an unbelievable capacity to be better than us, to outgrow our memories and our emotional burdens, which we transfer to them often unknowingly. But that does not happen automatically. That happens when there is intervention that is, as I intimated earlier, both political as well as pedagogical. It doesn't happen automatically, and I'm grateful to my many, many students and to my leaders, the people who enable me to lead <clears throat> or co-lead for creating this kind of environment. So I'm going to show you one more slide, but before I do that, I'm going to ask you to take a minute with each other, and if you have a question or comment or two or observation to share with us before I formally shut down, uh, would you just talk to your mate about it and see...